and we're back um, for this final talk of today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Baldi Ban, who's uh, academic dean of faculty of, of the Faculty of Science Technology and Technology. I'm going to manage to not mangle this, I'm sure, at Middlesex, um, and who many of you in the in the MBE community will know well, I'm sure, because he's been around the, the community for quite a while already. I think more recently he's, he's been focusing on uh, digital twins, not least of uh, digital twins of organizations and, and the use of MBE in those sort of contexts or modeling in those contexts. And uh, he'll tell us more about uh, these ideas and these, these works in his, in his talk now. I'll do the stage is all yours. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Stefan, for the introduction and also for the setting up of the MDE network in the UK. I think it's really pleasing to, to see the, the network come together like this. Uh, there's been some really good talks uh, today. So today I, I want to introduce the, the digital twin construct uh, and give a, a sort of an overview presentation of it. And in particular, I want to focus on a, the idea of a socio-technical digital twin. And, and I think we've already seen one example of that earlier on today. So if I just track on then. So the presentation is fairly traditional, you know, so there's no instant feedback, no whiteboard. We're just going to race through a few slides. I'm going to characterize what I put, what I propose is the, the, the general idea of a digital twin. This is actually based on a finding from a, a meta review of many uh, systematic review papers that have been now performed uh, and this paper was uh, is work done by the, the london digital twin research center it's currently in its second round of amendments and uh, given that it's a 30 page paper it, it'll take a while to get around to doing all those amendments i'm i'm going to after introducing the, the basic characteristics i want to move on to the notion of the socio-technical digital twin and in doing so i, I want to discuss the gap that really emerges between the, the social requirements, if you like, and, and the technical machinery of digital twins, and, and finally some thoughts on how some of the challenges can be addressed. So I remember this, uh, this paper in um, IEEE software from Fred Brooks uh, in 1987. It was a seminal paper. I was just completing my PhD and I'd gone off to work for GEC software and was working on one of those very early project support environments. Uh, in fact, they would later be called case tools. And I, I would see the word silver bullet associated with those case tools as the answer to, to all our problems in software engineering. And today it would seem that digital twins are the, are the new silver bullet. But actually, while we can say that, there, there's a and the reason why we can say that is, is from our survey paper, we can see that there are some uh, searches that you can see on Google search, for example, where you can uh, simple search for digital twin is showing an exponential growth. And similarly, when you search for digital twin in Scopus publications, then again, you see a similar exponential curve. So clearly, that is the, the, the interest being shown in digital twins more broadly. But there is some validity, if you like, in this explosion of interest, because we can also see from current market research that the, that the global twin, that the global digital twin market, you know, was in 2020 was valued at just uh, around three billion, and by 2026 it's uh, estimated to be near near 50 USD no, million, sorry, not billion. So. That's again demonstrating that there is widespread commercial interest. Now, although you know the, the MDNet is a UK-based thing, we, we know that there are many international colleagues attending today. I also want to just talk about digital twin as being at the heart of a UK research and innovation policy. So uh, a while ago in 2018, the, the UK government of uh, science published a review on computational modeling capability and i think this review is a really helpful pointer 
to the broader ideas around computational modeling and how it could help UK innovation. Uh, and last year in 2021, the, the UK Research and Innovation Strategy was published and, and digital twins are, are seen at the, the center of that. Uh, and you can, so I'll just uh, down at the bottom right hand side, you can see a quote from, from that report. So very, very simply, you know, one definition that I want to introduce here is, is that a digital twin is quite simply a, a virtual representation of a system facilitating a bi-directional communication between the system and its digital representation. So not a particularly nuanced definition, but sufficient to, to get a sense of what a digital twin might be. It's only when we unpack that definition and look at some of the examples that we can recognize there are quite a variety of, of, of digital twins. So, so just to put some more context, uh, at Middlesex, there's been a variety of strands of work in digital twins, and uh, including my, my work with, with Tony Clark on the Model Driven Organization. And it was important to consolidate all of that work uh, and, and to present a, a shop window of, of digital twin work. And so we, we in 2019, uh, the, the faculty launched the London Digital Twin Research Center. And, and since bringing that uh, work together, we've been really successful in, in exploring digital twin projects, uh, fund, externally funded projects in a range of uh, multiple domains, uh, including you know, the traditional 4.0 auto automation, uh, structural health monitoring. Uh, also, we're looking at uh, the use of digital twins to look at architectural heritage in Egypt. And, and of course, and, and, and very recently, the idea of vertical farming and constructing a greenhouse on campus and, and a simulation of that. Some of the, the work has also been reported uh, as part of REF 2021, and I'm sure we're all looking for those, looking forward to those results in May, aren't we? Um, so that impact was on a, on a bridge project that we constructed the digital twin for with Vietnam and, and of course, the, the TCS work on the model driven organization. Now, when we, so in 2019, I think uh, digital trends were, report, uh, digital twins were reported as a, as a top 10 Gartner trend. And our, and our team, as I said, conducted a, a systematic review, a meta review of the academic literature. And from that, we can see these um, five or six characteristics that, that really illustrate the, the notion of a digital twin. So first is the, the, the set of constructs that you might need to construct high fidelity virtual representations of some real world physical object, or it could be a, a system in the real world. Uh, secondly, the importance of, of a seamless connection. And, and this is a, a, a particularly um, a dominant characteristic because the connection actually defines a synchronization between the real world object and, and the digital representation. And in determining the, the frequency of connection, the, the synchro synchronicity, if you like, you can end up defining evolutions of types of digital twins. A key characteristic also of a, of a digital twin is the notion of a safe simulation environment. So you're able to do some real you know if what what if type analysis to explore your change intentions and it's risk-free because you're not changing the real world artifact and of course it's cheap because it's all all in, in the computer system so you know a really important characteristic and and more recently in the last few years as ai and machine learning has really taken over most things um the importance of uh, the use of AI to support learning mechanisms in, in the digital twin to support self-adaptation, self-regulation, self-monitoring, and self-diagnosis. And as a result of the, 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 the meta review, we have built a, a new definition of, of a digital twin, focusing on particular the idea of a pure play digital twin. And so there is this notion of, of, of uh, self-evolution through this adaptation, regulation, etc. There is this important symbiotic relationship between the physical asset and the virtual representation, where 
the fidelity and, and the rate of synchronization is, is really targeted and determined by what the use is of that um, particular digital twin and what services and operational and assets and and what value it is to to the business and that that that's all you know sort of critical to what the rate of synchronization might be how frequently do you update the the real world artifact with the digital twin so when we take this uh, seamless uh, communication characteristic then we can see that actually there's a, a and the discussion around digital twins can can cause confusion and then we can identify different types of, of digital twin and so what you're seeing here is as if you like the the evolution from what, what 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 we're calling a digital blueprint through to the idea of a pure play digital twin so in, in the first model we could see this as a, as a bespoke software application this is what say model driven engineering is doing it, it's um, constructing a digital representation and it's uh, imposing a system into the real world and so there is some automated elements to it and there is also a, a manual synchronization as indicated by the arrows and, and then there is a still a, a traditional computational model which is a digital model where there there is some uh, where there is manual synchronization between the real world artifact where we're getting data through some manual process into the, the, the digital representation, making some changes, maybe applying some uh, model driven practice or machine learning to, to improve or develop the, the digital representation. And then, then as, we, as we move on to the, I think what, what might be called uh, the digital shadow, this, I think, you would see as recognizably a digital twin as broadly popularized. So there is periodic but regular automated synchronization between the real world artifact and the digital representation. But it is a digital shadow. And so the, the manual update is still the dominant mechanism. Um, but that we are seeing uh, the use of uh, machine learning techniques to, to support the self-regulation, self-adaptation aspects of the, the digital representation. And then finally, we, we move on to what we call the, the pure play, which is full automation between the real world system and, and the digital representation of the system. So you can see how the, the characteristics of uh, a digital twin is is evolutionary we're, we're going from computational models through to the notion of a of a pure play digital twin um, obviously the, there's a set of underlying technologies which we've already hinted at uh, so the idea of machine learning um, extensive computational power through, through cloud fog or edge computing type of approaches um, for, for synchronization, particularly in, in Industry 4.0 contexts, then the requirements on um, 5G telecommunication protocols or, or even 6G as, as, as advances are being made there. And increasingly, we, we've got um, the, the sort of sensor-based model, uh, you know, uh, the physical world, which is driven by sensors, actuators, networking and, and computational power. And, and of course, the virtual reality, augmented reality to support particularly uh, healthcare environments. And, and as I've already hinted at, simulation is, uh, is a necessary element of technology. And, and the domains that can be covered, of course, are, are wide and varied. So, you know, from smart city, automotive, robotics, uh, and, and the model driven organization, of course. So, let me now just uh, move on to the idea of the the socio-technical digital twin and here i'm sort of really saying we are talking about computational models so we're not you know sort of discussing the idea of the the, the pure play digital twin or even the digital shadow we're really focusing on the idea of a computational model that has uh, that has a means of representing some human behavior and, and interaction 
and it is socio-technical in the sense of uh, Enid Mumford's work. So, you know, values are also important in, in that system. And, and of course, socio-technical digital twins have some additional complexity. There's a, uh, there's a greater di dynamism, there's complexity. We need to engage with multiple disciplines, uh, you know, particularly from the social sciences. And so we're, we're concerned about the, the sharing of a common language. And importantly, simulation is at the heart of this because the, the data generation requirements are, are much stronger. And, and as we've already seen in one of the, the earlier presentations today, they're ideally suited to agent-based models rather than physics-based models. And, and agent-based models bring together additional complexity. There's the, the, the different types of agents. Agents are, or actors are goal-directed. They react. They're, there's some sense of bounded rationality. They are going to interact freely with other agents. There's dependency and there's emergent behavior. So you cannot have a a guarantee of, of a starting and an end point which is going to be consistent. There will be some uh, probabilistic behavior embedded in that, so we cannot guarantee what we might actually uh, see as the final result of a socio-technical digital twin. So, as I say, it falls into the idea of a traditional computational model, but with um, with mechanical updates and some use of MDE and, and um, uh, machine learning approaches. So what might a definition of a socio-technical twin be? So it, it still is a system of systems. There, there is still a learning component, but uh, I think it's a, we need to recognize that it's a partial virtual representation where the, the rate of synchronization is still going to depend on technologies which are tailored, if you like, to, to theory exploration and explanation. So, uh, and we will include a mix of modeling of which agent-based simulation is, is absolutely at the core. So, although we've arrived at this definition, some of our sort of early work on uh, at uh, TCS, at, at Tata Consulting Services, uh, and with, with Tony Clark at Aston, um, we had some experiments, if you like, that were actually testing a, a language that we had developed for representing model-driven organizations. And that, so you can see some elements of that language on the right-hand side of the diagram there. But to to test that, uh, that uh, model-driven sort of representation that we, we developed a, a language, a ESL, led by Tony Clark, uh, which is based on the actor model of computation. And we ran a couple of very extensive um, uh, experiments. So the first experiment was to model the complexity of organizational structures. Uh, and of course, universities are, are, are incredibly complex uh, structures. And we looked at how a <coughs> sorry we looked at how a a department might wish to increase its rankings, if you like, in terms of ref, in terms of national uh, the NSS scores, if, as you're all familiar with, and what might be the actions that that department needs to do. And so that experiment was uh, reported uh, in the in the win in the winter simulation conference, and then. A second experiment that we did was uh, to look at the, the very strange phenomena that the Indian government conducted in 2016, which was to, to basically conduct a demonetization experiment with the country and, and extract key notes, key um, currency notes from, from circulation. And, and what we did was we, we modeled that, that process <coughs> and compared our simulation with the, with the ground truth of what was happening, what was being reported in, in the Indian media. And, and we saw some very close uh, sort of um, behavior, if you like. Uh, what we were simulating was what we saw, if you like. So a couple of experiments which sort of told us that this sort of idea of socio-technical actor-based uh, agent-based simulation was uh, was a was a sort of an interesting area and productive area for, for for research. So 
when you do embark on looking at socio-technical systems, then, then, then there are a few gaps that I think emerge. And, and one thing is that we, we need to, when we're, in, when we're encoding human behavior, we can't be certain that we know what digital models can be constructed and those that can't. We also have some challenges around the, the boundary. Where, where do we stop drawing interactions with, with the wider context that we're in? And those boundary, drawing the boundary is quite, quite difficult and quite important to get right. And in essence, then, there are some key elements that contribute to, to constructing a, a problematic gap, if you like. First is a socio-technical digital twin is a, is a socio-technical system, and therefore it needs to encode some of the issues of of human values uh, and, and the needs of people that are involved in that system. And so how we incorporate values, uh, and these values might be things like trust, privacy, transparency, autonomy, fairness. These are you know, difficult things. They're, they're easy to, to describe at some universal value, hence the universal value, but they're actually difficult to automate, to measure, to actually quantify in some meaningful term. So that is a, is a particular challenge. The a second challenge is, is around abstraction and, and the boundary. So what, what do we actually abstract? How do we know that our abstraction of, the, of, the, of this real world socio-technical problem is appropriate? And secondly, and sorry, and thirdly, there are a range of ethical uh, and epistemological concerns which are generated particularly when we begin to use algorithms, machine learning alg algorithms in particular. So let me just go through some of those uh, in, uh, in some, some detail, just conscious of the time. So the first is around abstraction. So essentially, we need to understand what, what it is we're trying to model, and, and so what you see there on the on the bottom right hand side is a is a socio-technical system, a, a digital twin that was developed for pandemic uh, research um, and was used in pandemic planning in the city of Pune by, by my ex PhD student. And what we have are a, a typology of citizens. But how do we know that we have got all the citizens? Have we got just enough? Have we got the typology right? And so you, you're never certain as to how accurate your, your abstraction of, of the real world is. So there, so there are issues around conceptual model validity. And secondly, and this goes back to the, the idea of uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, silver bullet, we, we may fall into what, what, what we can call a solutionism trap. That is the, the digital twin we are proposing as the hammer for this problem, but actually may not be the best solution to the problem. So a couple of uh, issues around abstraction. And then let, let's just uh, explore some of the ethical issues. So I, I refer to a paper by uh, Mitchell Stafter and all in 2016. And what they did in that paper was to to look at a, a review of um, the use of algorithms and the, the various ethical concerns that transpire when, when algorithms are used. And, and this, um, this framework, this conceptual map, as they call it, um, I, I used uh, subsequently as a way of understanding um, how these algorithms are reported in the, in the public media. And essentially then the, the um, the, the, the map but delivers uh, ethical concerns in two dimensions. There are the, the epistemic concerns, which are around the, the, the truthness, if you like, of the, the outcomes of a algorithm. So we have uh, inconclusive type of evidence. We have inscrutable evidence where there's a lack of uh, uh, traceability between the data and the conclusion because, and it's not accessible. Sometimes uh, the, the conclusions are, are based on incorrect data and therefore they're misguided. And then there are the, the normative concerns, and that is, you know, what is the, the moral norms and standards that, that these outcomes are being referenced against? 
and so such outcomes may be unfair so they may be biased or they may be transformative so they basically change our underlying understanding so so a good typical example is is how when we when we search for books on amazon for example we get suggestions of books that we may be interested in and so our field of of, of openness actually has been transformed our reality has been constructed to be narrowed to the things that are of interest to us by an algorithm so these are these uh, concerns however I, I propose are also visible in socio-technical digital twins particularly those that use agent-based simulation and where there is emergent and, and probabilistic behavior and and these concerns however depend on the validity of of the the simulation world the the, the socio-technical model that's being constructed so so first of all there are issues around conceptual model validity and we, we touched on those in terms of um, abstraction so how do you know your computer independent model is a, a valid representation of your real world but then of course there is the the, the model verification how well have you implemented that uh, independent model in, in your platform, you know, your target platform? And then when you execute your, your platform, how do you know that the results from that are operationally valid? And, and of course, all of those types of validation are, are dependent on, on the validity of the data that's being either supplied or being generated through, through, the, through the simulation. So those uh, those uh, ethical concerns, I think, are dependent on these sorts of validation issues here. So we could address these gaps through some some simple means. Uh, so we could take what I'm describing as as, as palliative approaches. Uh, so uh, so of course we can use uh, participatory design approaches. So we've got domain experts. We we might use a particular methodology such as action research, and we could embed the design with social science methods. And this could help in in helping us understand and make sure that we're addressing the, the conceptual models right and the validations right. We could also, as as we've seen in an experiment, use the the construct you know domain specific languages and and their supporting tools to make sure that that problem that, that mapping between the, the problem domain and the technology is better addressed we can also try and find what i call first order approximations so so for example when we're using video conferencing systems you know zoom and to and teams etc uh, broadly meet our needs but there is these additional gestures that we we try and incorporate by raising our hands uh, clapping and so on which are approximations so we could seek to address the, the gap of socio-technical design through finding first order approximations and then thirdly we can also look at methodological advances uh, and this i think is perhaps the one which is you know most uh, fruitful for us and and of course, domain specific languages are really, really key to that. So I, I would propose that when we look at digital twin design or socio-technical digital twin design, we, we need to recognize that it's syncretic. We really need to, to understand that we need to work with people from a domain that we might not necessarily work with. And that means Pulling in, you know, the, the methodologies from from action research, from from policy orientated research, such as the idea of theory of change, which is a you know a, a rigorous approach that can be uh, augmented and put into uh, into a simulation environment through appropriate uh, uh, language design. We could also try and address. Some of the issues around value sensitive design uh, this is an ongoing project in software engineering where we can understand how values such as transparency privacy can be traded off and and compared and to be prioritized in, in the design of systems and and increasingly we probably need to find ways of 
of representing uh, probabilistic programming, probabilistic modeling, and to provide guidance on how to interpret probable results in, in, the, in methodological terms. So, so there are some really um, rich avenues to explore in terms of um, the, the, the methodological advances that we could make. And let's see. So just uh, in, in conclusion then, the, the sort of advances uh, in agent-based uh, systems allows us to, to think about socio-technical digital twins and, and simulation more broadly. We need to recognize that we should avoid, try and avoid solutionism, but digital twins do have some, some real opportunity and uh, we can use them effectively. Uh, I think um, the shift to these, uh, these bigger problems in society, I think, is really interesting, but has opened up some really good challenges around abstraction, the the, the, the validation issues of of, 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 of um, simulations, and we also know that we need to recognise that there may be survival bias. That is, the the data and the and the knowledge that we've gained, you know, we may wish we may tend to focus on that and not recognise that there, there may be still other solutions out there. And, and as I've noted, gaps can be ameliorated through various techniques, but uh, methodological advances are probably the best value for, for, a, a pro, for this approach. And that is, in effect, our sort of uh, developing research strategy in our collaboration with, uh, with TCS and, and Aston. So on that, I'll conclude and, and open to questions.